I must admit, right up front, I've never been a big follower of yachting. But that aside, to my mind, Vinny Laos is a legend. Because Vinny, who became a paraplegic in 1990, last year, travelled around the world single-handed. Now, if that doesn't make him a legend, I don't know what does. And this is his boat, the Vision Quest. Now, I don't know whether I'd want to travel all around the world on that by myself, but there's the man himself. Vinny, how are you, mate? I'm well, Ian. How are you? Oh, I don't know. This cold weather. It is cold. Maybe we should be up in the tropics, do you think? Yeah, I think yeah. the tropics will be wonderful. North Atlantic, I think we've got today. Perfect. Perfect weather. Anyway, mate, can I come on board? Welcome aboard. Come yeah. on. I hate to make a fool of myself when I hop You on. won't. But don't worry about the cooking. We'll set sail for the Atlantic. <laughs> we'll cook on the way. Ooh, it's a bit of a dangerous place, that fly, isn't it? Very. <laughs> Now, Vinny, I have to ask you this, and I'm sure you've been asked it one million times before, but here's one million in one. Why did you do it? That's a good question, actually. The, um, that answer's quite simple. It was all because of a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Most things in life are because of a woman. Yeah, yeah. Mum did say they'll get me into trouble, and <laughs> this one did. The, the reality is that, if you can imagine, here I was. The, I'd been in a wheelchair for a couple of years. I had absolutely no direction in life whatsoever. And... One thing that I've realised is, is that there's been Kay Cotty, the first woman who sailed around the world, and there's been a youngest, Jessie Martin. Um, but the thing is, there's always been other people that have tried it. I came up with the idea to do it around the world, solo, non-stop and unassisted. I did a bit of homework and realised that it had never been done. And the next thing, next step was to find out whether it was a pipe dream or, or whether it was realistic. See, that's the other thing, isn't it? That you've mm. just got this amazing world. Now, you've got it here, do you? Yeah. You sort of have it hanging around in the in the um, yacht all the time? Or you keep it at home above the fire? Well, as you can see, mate, it's quite polished. So what <laughs> we do is we polish it every now and then and sleep with it on a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. What I, I put it up on the mantelpiece at home. It, um, to me, it's the greatest honour in a sporting award ever because I, I received this in a year that there were absolutely fantastic athletes from the Paralympians. Yes. Well, Your feat was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, it was. Thank you for that. There'd never been in the history of the world, never been a disabled person who'd even attempted to do what I did. So I was breaking new grounds in a way that I, I had to get out there and learn the lessons beforehand, which we did for seven years to break those barriers. So when I got out there, I couldn't say, hey, I've, I've buggered up, I need to be rescued, come out and get me. <laughs> I had to know that I can make it and yeah. I can get back home. But there must have been moments you thought to yourself, I don't think I'm gonna make this, I'm in trouble. And there, there were a few, there were a few moments when I actually thought this is it, you know, what am I doing out here? There was life- And that was the first day. <laughs> yeah, that is so right, that's so right. The moment I crossed that start line, I looked back and I've got footage of it. I look back and I'm thinking, you. Bloody idiot. <laughs> I, I can't tell you the words I use, but I'm thinking, you fool, what are you doing out here? I mean, for seven years, I had all this help, all these people. Then all of a sudden, here I am. I've just crossed the start line, and I'm thinking, come back, come back. What am I going to do? And I, I was totally self-sufficient after that. But were there some scary moments on the trip itself? There was a lot of scary moments, the life-threatening situations, but what I did was I turned those life-threatening situations where I was absolutely <laughs> petrified. Um, I really was, but the reality was that I turned that fear into an advantage by making it, utilising it as making more of a calculated risk. So let's say a life-threatening situation, I've got severe rigging problems, I've got a storm coming down and I know that I've got to climb the mast and fix the, the mast before the storm comes, otherwise I'll lose the mast. I don't know if you've ever been that scared, I'm sure some of the viewers would be, where your heart's in your throat, your head's pounding, you're burning up with hot, you're dry, you're shaking like a leaf, physically shaking like a leaf. And I'm up in the mast, I'm thinking, I've just got to do this. And um, you just have to do it. Mm. There's no one there to help you. No. Can't turn around and go home. I, I can't go home and say, well, it's almost five o'clock, I can clock off now, I'll go home, put my feet up. Just got to do it. It yeah. doesn't matter what happens, you just have to keep going. If you got a dream, you're going to go for it, or you're going to sit around and talk about it. And that was just my belief, and I figured that, you know, I really wanted this. More than anything, I wanted this. I was going to do everything to make it real. 
make it happen. Yeah. Now, just tell us about the, the idea of being unassisted. That means you actually can't dock at all. You can't get fresh supplies, you can't get anything. I could be half dead on a deck with no food, no water, no nothing. You pass me a glass of water or a biscuit, I'm disqualified. I'm not allowed to get off the boat whatsoever. That's unbelievable. Now, Vinnie, with your work with kids, you've actually set up a charitable foundation, haven't you? Parasail Caring for Kids is an organisation that I established back in 95, 1995. And a reason for that was originally we wanted to start raising awareness for kids to show what you can do. And then when I sailed around the world, we used that as a tool to start raising funds for kids. And Parasail is about getting the funds generated in the Parasail and in what we do is those kids that we help, we distribute that money accordingly to those kids who need it the most. And it's fantastic because it's working really well. And we can get straight into those kids who need it the most. That's great. So Parasail, it's fantastic, it's working well. Did you have anything that you thought to yourself, I really want this? You know, when I get off this boat, the first thing I'm going to do is have... Fish and chips. Fish and... Of all things, I caught, I caught a couple of fish while I was out there, and the last one was this beautiful, huge Spanish, Spanish mackerel. Yeah. But I, I just craved fish and chips. Well, I like fish and chips, and I might see if I can whip some up for you, but I was thinking myself, I most probably would have missed my stir fries or my Asian greens. I had enough like that. of that. I had enough of that. <laughs> I, had, I had plenty of rice, I had plenty of pastas, yeah. I had plenty of Asian food. I shouldn't say I had enough of it, but the fish and chips what really hit the nail on the head. And now, the cooking part starts. The famous Vinnie bread. Ian, I'm glad you said that because you've been talking about fish for so long, you've got me so hungry. I know you're going to take a while, so we may as well start with the bread, I think. Absolutely. Hey? Do you want me to yeah. open that for you? You can give us a hand. Now, this is one of these though. instant packets. This is what you took on the boat, This you? is, yeah, exactly. These instant packets are fantastic. Oh. Now, all I did, if you can imagine the boat rocking around a little bit, so this is heaven compared to being out there. Can you imagine the doggy bowl? Because I'd put all this in the doggy bowl and what I would do in, it was an absolute classic. Where you are right now, I would wedge the wheelchair in a corner, or yeah. sometimes I would do it here, but I soon learned not to. Once once the whole packet and everything went for a six, I learned not to do it here because of all the electronics. Yeah. And I'd sort of be on one side with the waves pounding and carrying on, not all the time, but this was when it was really hitting. My arms would be spread on a bench, so I had some balance, and I'd be sitting there with this wedged in the corner and stirring it like a caveman. And I'm shivering like a leaf, and on the packet it said, put in a warm place to rise. And I laughed my head off about five minutes. I'm sitting yeah. here thinking, yeah, right, how am I going to find a warm place down here? So what I did was I turned the engine on, I let the oh, engine, yeah. which is just behind me, yeah. and I let the engine run for about well, half an hour or so, switched yeah. it off. Then I went and wedged the bread in its tin on top of the engine and let it sit there for a few hours. That's our cake tin. Look, mate, you just keep kneading that, because remember that Spanish mackerel you caught? Yes. I've got a clever idea of what you should have done with it. Well, I'd like to hear it, mate, because I'm getting quite hungry, and I think <laughs> that would be a great idea. It's all right, you get fed. I don't, don't come here for nothing, and I'll just, I'll just talk to you about what I'm doing, because all I've got is I've got a bit of foil here, and I've got some fish, and I'll show you what I'm doing in two seconds. Just, I'll come and show you here. And I'm just going to grab the fish and put it on the foil, just like that. So I've just put the fish on the foil, and I bought some ginger, which is in a, in a jar. And I just grab that. We put a little bit over the top. And just spread that over the top of that, just to give some flavor. Of course, when you're close to land, you could use fresh. But, you know, we're not counting on that. Where did you catch the mackerel? I actually caught it the same day that I cooked it up. Oh, right. And I, I, was, I was only about, oh, 700 miles south of the equator in the, uh, in the South Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Well, well, now I just put some soy on it and I wrap it up really tightly and sort of crimp it just like that. And because Vinnie's got this wonderful little stove here and all I do is just plop it on there, just on top of your stove. Don't worry about any grills, anything like this. Just plop it on top and hope to hell <laughs> that the soy doesn't run out. But that'll be beautiful and succulent and juicy, I hope. Well, we'll come back later on. We'll have a look at the bread. And, of course, I'll show you my wonderful fish. Fantastic. I hope it's wonderful. This is Cape Horn, folks. Woo! Now, Vinny, 
I am a bit worried about you. You spend six months going around the world. You're surrounded by water. All you want when you come back is fish and chips. It does seem a bit strange, doesn't it? But hey, how could I resist it? Huey's famous fish and chips. That's the go. And look, the secret's in the batter. Always a beer batter, nice and crisp and light. And all we need for that is some beer, of course. Just a bottle of beer, small bottle, freshly opened because in my batter, what gives it the lightness is actually the yeast in the beer. And then to that we add half as much water. I am accurately measuring this for a change because you do need to do that. We then add some self-raising flour. Now, this is the real secret of the beer, to keep it nice and light. We add a little bit of baking powder to that flour, just to lighten it even more. Because self-raising flour obviously has baking powder in it, but I just add a little bit more. Just about half a teaspoon in there, mix it up. And then we start whisking, adding the self-raising flour, little by little. And you do it very slowly. Don't do it huge amounts of flour because you want it to be smooth for a start and you want it to stay light. By adding it bit by bit, you'll make sure that happens. Now, I just add some salt. Do that in the middle after you've started adding some of the self-raising flour and then keep on going. You see, that's looking quite thick. And to just check it, let's just have a look. See, that's perfect. Just have a look here, Rob. That just coats your finger. Now, you don't have to stick your finger in if you don't want to. You can do it with a wooden spoon. But that's about the thickness that I want. What I've done here is I've just hand cut some chips, just some large potatoes. But what I have done with them is I've cooked them in the fat very low, at about 140 degrees to start, just to start them off. So you parboil them in a fryer. To, well, that, I suppose that's the word you use. And then you turn up the heat on that fryer and cook them at about 190 degrees. So you actually have to cook them twice. Now that's very important. Now I've drained them really well. That's very important as well. All these steps are important. I think that's the thing that I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> well, I keep on going about it. And then into just some vegetable oil, some vegetable shortening, something like that. Something with not a lot of flavor. You don't want to flavor them too much. And also just keep an eye, just keep shaking them so they're kept separate. Now, the tartare sauce. Once again, pretty important stuff. And I've just got some bought mayonnaise. We'll just put a few good dollops of that in a bowl. And to that, I then add just a few other flavorings. Now, this is traditional. Some chopped gherkins, some chopped capers, some spring onion, and also a little bit of chopped parsley. And then, just for a little bit of flavouring, I put a little bit of Dijon mustard in, and I'll also put the smallest squeeze of lemon. And when I say the smallest, I really literally mean that. Yep, and then we then mix that up really, really well. If I'd travelled six months around the world on a small boat, I would want homemade tartare sauce. Absolutely. Let's just put that to the side as well. And let's have a look at our chips. They're not looking bad, are they? Look at those. They're looking good. All right, we'll drain them really, really well. Right, now, let's start thinking about the fish itself. And what I've got here is I've just got some blue eye, but you could use blue eye, groper, snapper. I think flathead is beautiful. Also, whiting is wonderful. Very expensive, but wonderful. And I'll just grab that batter and then we dip the fish into that and make sure it's not too coated because I want it, as I said before, I want it light and a bit, I suppose fluffy is the word, isn't it, with a batter? No, crispy, fluffy, crispy, whatever. And just have a look here, Rob. Now, this is the other secret so that it doesn't stick on the bottom. You put it into the oil and wait until it starts to float before you let it go. This is looking pretty good, so let's just get these fries onto the plate. You, of course, inside would keep these fries hot just in the oven while you're waiting for the fish to finish. And I just will hang on to that, I've forgotten that. We want to drain this really well. See, look at that. That is light and crispy. 
and once again drain it really well. Now look, I'm as biased as hell, but that is good looking batter. All right. Now, onto the plate, a little bit of salt on, I forgot the salt on the chips. Hey, you can't have fish and chips without a decent, oh, I got a bit excited then. I think we'll put some into, a, into my hand there. Came out a bit faster than I expected. So a little bit of salt on both of those. And do as I say, not as I do. So just a little bit. <laughs> and I think three pieces of fish will be plenty there. A good dollop of this tart here, just to the side. And I think a decent sized piece of lemon is pretty important. So we'll just cut that in half. Put that just there. There you go, Vinny. Now, I don't know whether this is worth waiting six months for, but beautiful fish and chips. Huey's famous batter, hand-cut chips, homemade tart here. Hey. As a man who gets seasick in a paddling pool, I find that pretty scary stuff. I don't know whether it's for me, but thank goodness I'm not a bad cook. And I think the thing that I would miss most is some green vegetables. I don't know whether I could cope six months without green vegetables. A wonderful stir fry of some Asian greens would be the answer, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. I've just got a little bit of vegetable oil in a wok, and I'm then going to make a bit of sauce, which I'm going to add towards the end. Just some soya sauce, a little bit of oyster sauce, not too much because it's pretty strong stuff. And the smallest amount of sambal olic, which is the Asian chilli paste. About half a teaspoon of that. And also to that we will add some vegetable stock. Just the packet one's fine. And we'll whiz that up with a whisk and just set that to the side. We may need to add a little bit more soy. Who knows, we'll have a look. All right, our oil's pretty hot. To that I'm then going to add a clove of crushed garlic. And some grated fresh ginger. About a quarter of a teaspoon of the ginger, one clove of the garlic, as I mentioned. We'll just stir that around. Now, I don't want this to get too much colour. It doesn't matter if it gets a little bit, but I certainly don't want it to burn. And then I'll start adding some vegetables to that. I've got some bok choy. Look, these are just the, the baby Chinese cabbages, which I've cut in half. Clean it very, very well. It grows in sand. Make sure you wash it well. So we'll throw that in. Spring onions just cut in pieces like that. Some Chinese broccoli. Now just have a look at the Chinese broccoli. I've just cleaned that up a bit, but I am going to cut it into pieces before I throw it in. Like that. And also some wongabok, which is the white Chinese cabbage. And we'll just cut a piece off the end there, which is great, and throw that in as well. Just break it up a bit. And now stir it around just a little bit. Try to keep it in the wok, it really helps. I've got fingers and all in there, and to that we will then add this liquid. And once again, just toss it around a little bit, just to cover it with that stock and soy mix. And cover that quite firmly, and we'll cook that. Now, it won't take long. I'm sort of semi-steaming it purely and simply because I've got some harder veggies in. I mean, if you were just doing snow peas and, and things like that, you could just stir fry it and then throw it out. But by putting the top on, you semi-steam it. It should be ready in about two or three minutes. And just before it's finished, I'll throw these snow peas in only for a few seconds. You still want them crisp. Now, that's looking good. There's plenty of liquid in that. I, I do want it to be a little bit soupy because I uh, love that liquid at the end. I drink it with my spoon. Anyway, just get these veggies out onto a plate. This is what I would want. Some wonderful, crispy, steamed green vegetables. 
and we started getting over and next minute we're doing about 20 knots down this wave just trucking along and I thought this is it. Vinny, that looks good. Fantastic, huh? Smells good too. I was going to bring you an authentic original one, the leftovers from Miranda Sea, but I think it's a new one that looks quite good. I think it's good. And I'm a bit worried about the spring onions. I just had those in my pocket. I tell you what, that looks like quite a treat. <laughs> and I, it looks fantastic. You don't look... mind if I... No, yeah, yeah, go to okay. it. Okay. Anyway, on that note, we have to go. And thanks very much for joining us. And Vinny, mate, lovely to meet you. Mate, that's absolutely fantastic. Oh, good on you. See you soon. Take care.